the spring of the Murray River is found high in the snowy mountains. But the basin that it helps feed stretches over a vast area across four states, New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland and South Australia. The flow of the river can be controlled by dams and barrages and the states have traditionally used them to look after their own farmers rather than worry about the others in different states further downstream. This is where the fresh water meets the seawater. Now, in normal times, if there is such a thing anymore, the fresh water level should be far higher than the seawater because there's a big dam here holding it back. But just look at how the water levels have fallen. Just a 20% drop in rainfall can lead to a 70% drop in stream flow. The drought is only part of the problem. What's making things much worse is the demand for water from farmers much further upstream, which means there's very little by the time the river reaches here. The lower lakes are effectively being irrigated out of existence. There used to be 55 farms in this area. Now there are just 10. Leslie Fisher and her husband Mick fear they're being sacrificed to save other agricultural land further upstream. We are the forgotten people down here. We, we contribute to the economy. We care about our environment more than anything and um, we care about what's, what's happening. I mean, for our future, for our future generations, we've got a grandchild, another one on the way. You know, this is our home, this has been, this is our, we're into our sixth generation here and I've got a really um, close affinity to, to the land here and the area. It's a special part of the world. And uh, here we are with the government Mr. Rudd's going overseas now and he's telling other, other countries how to run their, their, their environment, telling the Japanese not to go out and do the whaling and that. How can, how can he do that when he's letting his own, own river system die, his, own, his, his nation die? You know, it's just, it, it, we're just getting sold down the river all the time. You know, and it is productive land. Uh, we've done very well. Uh, with using, you know, with water use efficiency, we've been right up there at the top, you know, with probes, weather stations, doing everything correctly. And with, you know, very uh, third grade water, that we, we, we've got through with it. But now we've nothing, we can't even, you know, access water. As if to underscore the sense of crisis, Australia's Prime Minister Kevin Rudd visited the Lower Lakes region earlier this year. What has um, stunned me is the extent to which uh, this shoreline has moved from there to there in the space of a year. The chronic water crisis is one of the major challenges facing his government and he knows it's a national problem that extends far beyond these lakes. It's the management of this entire system, this massive Murray-Darling system, from, the, from Queensland where I come from, through New South Wales, across Victoria and to here. And unless we manage this uh, river system better in the long term, um, then, then what we do in terms of uh, shorter term measures uh, will not help. There are parts of the Murray River where it's now almost possible to wade from one side to the other. At this point a sandbar has emerged, which also would have been unthinkable before the present drought. The river is paying the price of being over allocated. That's to say farms along its banks have been promised too much water. Back in the 1950s when the state governments encouraged farmers to cultivate their land, it wasn't a problem. Good rainfall meant there was a rich supply of water. Now too many water licenses have been sold. We know that uh, we've historically over allocated. We know we have not managed this basin as a, as a basin. We've managed it as separate rivers. Uh, and we know uh, that we're facing reduced inflows, historically low inflows, uh, as a result of climate change. So really the policy task is the same. You have to reduce how much we're taking out of the rivers. The government has announced a multi-billion dollar buyback scheme. That's to say it's purchasing the water titles of these farms in Queensland in the upper reaches of the river system 
which will be used further downstream. Buyback's essential, um, but in our view, given where we are now, what we know today with the, in, with the drought crisis and with what the scientists are now saying with climate change, it's not happening quick enough. So we need to accelerate the buyback. But again, you can do a good buyback and a bad buyback. A good buyback encourages the efficient use of that water. So it encourages people to reinvest in irrigation efficiency. A bad buyback is where you just clumsily take it out of the system. It would be wrong to think of this solely as an Australian problem. This is a grain storage facility further up the Murray-Darling Basin, not far from Dubbo in New South Wales. Normally this area should be full of grain, but when we visited earlier in the year, it was virtually empty. And just look at these cavernous silos. The grain should reach the rooftops. Australia is one of the world's biggest exporters of wheat, and this is its food bowl but successive failures of its crops are a major factor in the global shortage of basic food. Then there's the wider ecological impact. This area of wetlands which borders the lower lakes is the world-renowned Karong. It's absolutely vital for migratory birds, but in recent times the number making the journey here has fallen by 90%. The scientists predict the situation will get worse. People are right when they say, we've had droughts before, we'll have them again. What's new? Well, what's new is uh, the extreme condition that that has left the floodplain vegetation and in-stream ecology of the Murray-Darling Basin, right on from not just the lower lakes, but way up the system, uh, both the Darling and in the Murray. We have trees that are hundreds of years old uh, in stands that are now 80, 90, 95 percent dead. Um, that is outside of our experience as managers of this river. A river's number one aim from nature's perspective is to empty, empty nutrient into the sea, especially salt load. And that's not happening? And that's not happening, no. No. Dennis is able still to harvest crops from his land, but they're a fraction of what they used to be. Seven years ago, when irrigation water was readily available, he got five separate cuts of hay. Now that farms are totally reliant on rainfall, he gets just one cut and an eighth of the income. The past three months has seen 10 millimetres of rainfall. The average is 80 to 100 millimetres. So he desperately needs irrigation water from the lakes. The federal government must, must be given the authority, the power and the means to take over the running of the river from the four different states so that everyone is equally treated that uses and takes water out of the river. The construction of a pipeline to provide drinking water to the people who live alongside the lower lakes and keep their cattle alive. It won't provide irrigation water to nourish the parched land, but still, it's a vital lifeline. If nothing else, it keeps the communities here alive. The previous government of Prime Minister John Howard announced the nationalisation of the Murray-Darling Basin but the individual states are wrangling still over the distribution of its water supplies. Decades-old attitudes have been hard to shift. This is already the world's driest continent, and the effects of climate change are more profound here than in other parts of the planet. But the battles here over dwindling water supplies don't bode well. If states within the same country find it hard to reach agreement on how to share a river system, what hope neighbouring countries when faced with a similar dilemma? <laughs>